Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for coming uh, to this panel, which is History on the Ground, Personal Accounts. Um, my name is Alary Harris. Um, I'm, I've been the features editor at The Nib um, for the last decade, um, and I'm a super big history comics nerd, so I'm very excited uh, to be moderating this panel today. Um, I'd just like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands that we meet on, the um, Piscataway, Pamonkey, uh, Teneke, Mataponi, Chikamahoni, Monakan, and the Pawahatan. I'm sorry if I if I misfound those. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge their um, uh, elders, past, present, and emerging. Um, so on this panel today we have um, Anna Penas, um, Durf, Back Durf, um, Tracy White, and Michael Cherkis. Um, they're all going to be speaking about um, recent books that they've put out. Um, and the processes behind those. So I'm just going to ask each uh, person to uh, uh, introduce themselves as we go through with a slide and um, just a brief thing about the work that they'll be talking about or works. Uh, so if we'd like to begin with um, Anna. Hi, uh, I'm going to make an Hispanic English, OK? <laughs> Anna is going to help me, <laughs> the other Anna. Uh, I can say about my work that um, I am I work in a three fields: uh, feminines, uh, historical memory. That as for me, historical memory in, in Spain more. Um, se dice? Usually, I work in uh, historical memory in Spain. I is. Uh, what I mean is the history in the 20th century of Spain, uh, Spanish Civil War, Frankings, uh, these last years. And about the cities, how the cities are, uh, are changing, uh, gentrification, tourism, uh, conflicts in the neighborhoods. So it will be my three fields, and I mix, independent of the projects, there are one thing on the other. And in this project is more feminist and the historical memory. Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so next up we have Tracy White. Hi. Um, so I do nonfiction comics, usually uh, autobiographical or um, just nonfiction. And one of the things that I think ties everything together is looking at the universal emotions that we all experience, even if the life experiences are different. Cool. And Michael Chekis. Hi, uh, my most of my comics are actually science fiction mysteries called *The Silent Invasion*. *Red Harvest* is uh, quite a departure uh, from everything that I've done before because what I had done before was very light entertainment. *Red Harvest* is about the Holodomor, the forced famine in Ukraine in 1932 and 33 that was uh, suppressed. Um, by the Soviet Union, they didn't. They, it wasn't allowed to be talked about until 1991, when the Soviet <coughs> Union fell. Hi, I'm Durf. Uh, my two nonfiction books that we're talking about today are uh, uh, Kent State, which is about the Kent State massacre at the depths of the Vietnam War, and uh, My Friend Dahmer, which is a uh, researched autobiography about my teenage friendship with Jeffrey Dahmer. I'm really sorry, but there seems to be a slide missing here, so um, just pretend that you saw one. Oh, there is one there. It's right That's there. Kent State, yeah. Yeah. That's Kent State. Okay. I sent you so many slides. There are yeah, it's too many slides. <laughs> and you've lost them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you'd think that I would be familiar with this because I am the person who put the slideshow together. Um, so I wanted to um, get everyone started talking about the human story behind history. And I, um, uh, my, a colleague of mine, Shay Merck, interviewed Durf recently, and uh, he said, I start with interviews because the people who were there, with the people who were there, because I want to hear the story firsthand. Um, and I believe that is the way a lot of people start, you know, reading first-hand testimonials of experiences that people have had. Um, and so I just sort of wanted to, um, uh, I'm going to kick off with a, a, a slide from uh, that Durf sent me about um, Jeffrey Dahmer and fishing. Mm. Um, and I want you to, if you can speak about that, and I'd love to, uh, to invite the other panelists to also mm -hmm. speak of their experiences of interviewing. Well, yeah, a lot of this, um, 
a lot of these stories, with my friend Dahmer in particular, came from first-person accounts by either my, well, obviously my own experience, but also my friends. And this one came from my friend who went fishing with uh, Jeffrey Dahmer at like age 16. And the whole book is that way. It was just gold, and it was stuff that has never been recounted before. And now it's pretty well known because, you know, this was depicted in the movie as well. Um, pretty effectively, actually. It was a good scene in the movie. And, and you know, if you, if you don't ask questions, if you don't go to the, the people who, who have these stories, you'll, you'll never get them because the stuff was not written about anywhere. It was not recounted in any other news story or, or anything. It, it's just stuff that I uncovered. And you do that by talking to people. And, and for those of you who don't know, like, could you sort of say, like, Jeffrey Dahmer is a serial, became a serial killer, so... <laughs> Does everybody <laughs> not know who Jeffrey Dahmer is? I mean, like Raise your hand if you don't know who Jeffrey Dahmer no, is. Okay, all right, great. <laughs> uh, he was the most infamous serial killer since Jack the Ripper. He, uh, and a Netflix star. Yeah. Um, it was uh, 17 men and boys he killed and then did unspeakable things to their their bodies, so he was quite a grisly character. But he was a guy that I was friends with from age 12 to age 18, and two weeks after our high school graduation, which is the last time I saw him, uh, he killed his first victim. So My Friend Dahmer is not the story about his crimes, it's the story of the spiral down. Yeah, so does anyone else tell me tell me Michael how did you how did you approach your work when you were looking through do you used uh, accounts that other people had because yours is a fictionalized history. Yeah, and I, when I was researching this I found almost all of the accounts that I uh, listened to or read were very anecdotal because uh, the the uh, stories were, were told in the 90s and the in the 2000s and it was only then where there, there's a group in uh, Toronto called the Holodomor Research and Education Consortium that has uh, been recording these stories for uh, the last 20 years. Um, and it, what I found about the stories is that they were very anecdotal and there was never, a, you couldn't get a complete sense of the uh, whole famine. And so rather than tell like, actu like stories of actual people, I, I took these stories and synthesized them into fiction and then ended up telling the story through the point of view of this one fictional person who was the only survivor in his fictional family in this fictional village in Ukraine, right? So, and, um, and I basically incorporated stories that I'd heard uh, through the uh, anecdotes uh, that, um, I'm gonna say primarily the Holodomor Research and Education Consortium had recorded, and I. What was interesting, I found out people, they they had uh, videotaped uh, people that I actually knew their children, and I had no idea that uh, the their their parents had survived the uh, famine, because right? nobody they just didn't talk about it. Yeah. yeah. And when you say anecdotal, you mean they were talking about their own experiences. their own experiences. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and they were and the stories because when their memories were from the time when they were five or six or seven and they were remembering very specific things right like somebody would remember that all they ate was uh pine cone pancakes or birch bark pancakes right and, and that's how they survived or somebody would say well luckily they didn't take our cow away and so we survived because we we actually got milk from the cow right but uh, so there were no you didn't get the sense of um you didn't uh from these stories you actually don't get the sense of how it happened so they, then the research in terms of how it happened, uh, you have to go into the more uh, like uh, scholarly uh, research, right? To uh, find out where, like what were the decrees that the Soviets uh, 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 set out in order to uh, like increase requisitions and stuff from the peasants, right? The food requisitions it's to the point where they just took all their food away, right? And there's one chapter in there where in August of um, 1932, they um, issued a decree that all the property on the collective was state property in everything. So there's a chapter where I deal with that, where uh, one of the boys finds a pigeon and he gets shot because they, they accuse him of stealing uh, state property. Yeah. So, and yeah. so. 
Tracy. Yeah, so I actually, Unaccompanied is about five very courageous, strong teenagers, to me they're superheroes, who, uh, from four different countries, who undertake the very dangerous journey to walk to the United States to seek asylum. And then once they're in the United States, there's this whole other journey that happens with the immigration system. So unlike Durf, who had memories or people that he could connect to, or Michael, who was able to access stories that were recorded, I was going, I thought originally, I, I didn't want to interview the, the kids for a few reasons. One was that it would jeopardize their cases, and the other was uh, re-traumatizing them because these kids have to tell their stories over and over again. Um, so, so, and if you talk to the lawyers, which I did and I interviewed them extensively, the lawyers are only hearing the terrible things that happen because that's all they're interested in. It's what they need to know to win the cases. But I was interested in who are they and how did they find the strength and what did they read and what did they play? play with as children and, and all the things that you don't find out because we always have this narrative of sort of pity and there's so much more. And so I originally thought, oh, I can just interview the lawyers and it will be fine and quickly found out that wasn't the case. And so I ended up making partnerships with people from the countries that these kids were from who had relevant lived experiences or similar experiences and then asking, interviewing them and then incorporating that into the notes from the lawyers and then sending it back and asking you know, very specific questions and getting feedback that way. It was a really collaborative process. And that um, rolled into the drawings because when I did the drawings, I'm, uh, you know, I, I grew up in New York and I can't, I can't walk in their shoes. I can walk next to them. And to do that, I have to actually collaborate with people from their countries and um, show them their drawings and ask them questions and really listen to them and then make changes as, as needed. So it was a real partnership mm. the whole way through. And you interviewed your grandmothers, Anna. <laughs> um, this project uh, was um, just before I was made in another collective project when I was studying fine arts. Uh, that uh, were with a group. There were two friends that were so, uh, sociologists. So, so, so they studied sociology. They studied sociology, and we were uh, interviewing uh, all people, men and women, that in that moment had 80 years, as my mother's in that moment, that uh, they were uh, experienced the Civil War and the Franklin's. So I uh, learned from my friends uh, how they uh, manage the interview and was very interesting the perspective of the historias de vida the histories of lives is, is a methodology that is I, I don't use like right but it's something I, I learned that is about uh, taking care about the silence the contradictions how is the way uh, the, peop the person is expressing their uh, experience also, there, there, is, mm, there was the sens this sensibility that I learned from them. And when I started the project of my grandmothers, I asked them the, for the record. So I went to the house of my grandmothers uh, to talk with them, uh, also uh, with this perspective that uh, they had to tell me all their, uh, their life from the beginning until the end. Ah, yeah. And uh, I was really uh, focused on respect how the way they are were expressing their lives, no, yeah. and not to say the the answer in the question. Yeah. It was, mm -hmm. and after in another project, as I have used this knowledge for other projects uh, that I also made with an anthropo anthropologist, and now I'm in another project that I am also using the, this perspective. Yeah. I think it's interesting. I studied oral history at school as well, and there was a, um, I remember being told it's a really great idea to get people to start at the beginning of their own story because it doesn't actually matter. If you sit down and ask them questions, a lot of the time people will just insert that question into the narrative of their story where they're up to and they'll just bring you back to it. So sometimes it's helpful to do, just sit there, just listen, just do the, yeah. Yeah. It was uh, three hours of records. Oh, I bet, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How does one tell your entire life story? 
Um, so I wanted to sort of now bring in a question that I have around this, which is what impact does fictionalization have on the authenticity of a story? Um, you know, can it make a story more authentic? Is it less authentic? Or where is the line between truth telling about historic events or falsifying history, which I feel is a really fine line that we walk as cartoonists anyway, because we are literally recreating things on paper. So I'd like to just open it up. Who wants to, does anyone have a perspective they'd like to share? <laughs> Sorry. I can't turn Why did you choose Michael to fictionalize? Like it was because it, there was just too. It was too hard to. I thought it would be easier to uh, tell the story to fic by fictionalizing it and yeah. and telling it through the eyes of one uh, character. Um, and even though as the story evolved, it he's, he's, it it wasn't necessarily told through his eyes, but it's his memories, right? That are that he's sort of uh, we're, we're witnessing, right? Um, I just found it would be easier and, and uh, more effective to communicate the story that way, like to, to readers. Well, it seems like your story, the, the, for those of you who haven't read his book, which is coming out later this year, right? There's November, a, yeah. November, it's a, um, you're using like all, of, you're tapping, tipping on all of these different aspects of the famine. So it's using these characters as a yeah. way of just explaining things that maybe you wouldn't be able to if you were just focusing on one one individual, right? That's the yeah, idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I, I, I thought. And I really thought to kind of tell it through the uh, different uh, characters in the family too, right? So that you see the father disappears and uh, then the, the, the daughter that gets married to the communist, she has her second thoughts on the whole thing and, and basically she comes, well, you have to read it, it's, it's sad. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's but it's a, but it's a, it's a, it's a device that enables you to explore more things that happen to more people in a, in by using a one family as a device. Yeah. Yeah. And do you think that in a, allows you like to give readers a, a, an insight into something that is so long ago now and so outside of most people's regular experience that it's useful to have multi perspectives? I um, I think it works in this case. Um, I did have uh, somebody at the uh, two people, two women at the whole of the more research and education committee in Toronto read it, and uh, one of the ladies there, both of her parents are, uh, were survivors of the of the famine, and she said it really resonated with her. Mm. So that was really important to me that it resonated with her there. And, but the sad part about it is because there's two things that I deal with in the book, they won't present it to the Ontario government uh, Ministry of Education as a, as a curriculum, as a book to put in the curriculum. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. That's because because I, I mentioned cannibalism. Oh, right. And okay. uh, which I thought I treated in a, in a, like a tasteful manner because I didn't. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. oh. No, no, I think. Oh, it... no. Accidental pun, everyone. Turn away. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean that. <laughs> and then, Trust me, you got to watch out I for know. puns like that. <laughs> and, then, and then there's a scene of uh, rape that is in the book, yeah. but it's not, again, it's not depicted. Uh, it's through the, through the eyes of the mother's daughter. So it's, it's, but, mm. so they, they, they just won't, they won't, even though grade 10 and grade 11 kids have seen the worst stuff yeah. on, on TV. Oh, I feel like this is a whole other conversation, yeah. like the standards of what is appropriate. <laughs> Tracy, I'm really interested in hearing your take because you did, you made a decision to fictionalize stories, but to protect the identities right. of yeah, people. I was say, so the events that happen in the book, those have all happened. The, the, mm, Four of the teens, they're more composites, and it was to actually to protect the identities of, of these kids. And um, one person who I really communicated a lot with, Fanta, who is from Guinea, Africa, I also had to, I changed a lot of the identifying details for her also to protect her identity. And I think that's, you know, that's an obvious reason why it works better to fictionalize, but it's a very fine line because I didn't make up anything that happens. I didn't think that that was my place to do. Yeah. So you still have to get the stories and then figure out how you can tell them in a way that protects the people that, whose stories you're, you're telling. Yeah, and it's. I feel like it's interesting because you have a where are they now type section in it where yeah. it's like where and and I I feel like that for me was the moment where I was like wait are these real people like what's going on like it that, was a that's you know, really where they are <laughs> yeah. each of those. 
each of those people, you know, they, those people are in those places. And there are so many people, so, I mean, there's thousands and thousands of children who walk by themselves every year to the United States to seek asylum, and it's, if you think of it as a funnel, the smallest portion actually make it across. And, and from that smallest portion, there's an even smaller amount that actually um, get, get through the legal system. Um, everyone is entitled to a trial, but not to a lawyer. So um, the organizations that support unaccompanied refugee minors are so important because with a lawyer, they have about a 90% chance of their cases, of winning their cases, and without that, it's, it's, like, some, it's like below 50%. Mm. Um, and uh, <coughs> I don't know where I'm going with that, but I, just, it's, I think it's an important thing that people don't actually understand. And actually, if you buy this book, all my author's proceeds go back to the organizations that support unaccompanied refugee minors. Big plug. Because those <laughs> lawyers are incredible people. I mean, just as these kids are heroes, so are they. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think this is a really interesting idea, like the idea of where you draw the line between, you know, um, what is someone's real life and what are you depicting? I feel like, um, Durf, you seem extremely committed to making sure that everything is very meticulously footnoted um, and uh, that it's Yeah, is I get a little a carried really away happened. with uh, footnotes. What made you decide that that's the sort of the area that you, the way you approach you want to take to your own work? Well, with, with both those books, they're fairly controversial topics. So, you know, people reading the book would think, oh, oh, how does he know that? And then you get to the back of the book and there's the footnote that shows exactly where that information came from. So I think it adds a layer of legitimacy to the story. But, I, you know, I think historical fiction is great. All you have to do is be upfront about it. Yeah. You know, just right at the beginning. Uh, the book I'm working on now is historical fiction, but it's going to have it an 18-point type across the title page. This is historical fiction. Yeah. So there's a difference between nonfiction and historical fiction. But uh, librarians will tell you, you know, graphic novels can't really be nonfiction because we create images. Mm -hmm. Even if they're sourced, we're still, you know, it's kind of a gray area. It's not straight nonfiction. We're creating dialogue. We're creating characters. And even if they're based on on source material, we're still creating those, so it kind of crosses the line in their minds. But I think that's fairly blurry, and I'm comfortable with that. Yeah, yeah. How about you, Anna? Are you comfortable with the blurriness between the reality, the lived, real lived experience <coughs> of your grandmothers, and then the, you know, the the, the art that you have created? I want to ask this in Spanish. Okay. Um, En mi caso estaba entrevistando a dos personas muy mayores, donde la memoria ya funciona de una manera un poco arbitraria. Pero a mí eso tampoco me importaba, porque yo lo que quería también era como recoger, como he comentado antes, la parte de las sensaciones, de las emociones, como transmitir eh, esto. So I didn't mind because what I want to get was the emotions. What I want to get was the emotions to f show that emotion. So their memory was blurred, but I was listening and taking that. En, entonces eh, hay mezcla porque los recuerdos que ellas tienen son reales, al, pero eh, el pegamento de la historia tiene ficción. So, there, there is a mix because the, the memories they have, they are reals, but the glue of the story is a kind of fiction. It's, there is a line of fiction of okay. putting all that memories okay. together. Porque ellas eh, están representadas en el presente y en ese presente hay una ficción. Una ficción muy costumbrista, pero está inventada. So they're talking from the past, but they are also being represented in the present, and I take a fiction of that present. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a really difficult thing generally is that, you know, when people are remembering things, they're not remembering, you know, they remember things differently as they age. And um, and there's also, you know, I think that's why when we talk about uh, tapping into oral histories or like, you know, for, like primary documents for things, it can be really helpful. But also in some ways it's nice to acknowledge that that's a reality for people is that, you know, there is this past and the past is a, is a construct. Um, I really want to move into now talking about um, like some visual research stuff because I think that this is a really important aspect of comics. 
I know that most people doing comics are, um, uh, you know, doing the visual research at the same time that they're researching the text and the story. So it, there's sort of a symbiotic thing that's happening there. Um, so we're talking about like people, clothing, human built environments of the past. Um, uh, maybe sometimes they're overwhelming in volume or they require deep detective work. Um, so. I wanted to sort of ask about the, the process there. I've used an image here from um, from Michael's book, Red Harvest, um, of Kulaks being thrown out of their house. Kulaks. And you, and you had like a whole bunch of those sorts of images. But um, I might start actually with, go back to you for a moment, Anna, and talk about like the, the, these photos that you have here of your, your grandmothers. <laughs> Um, my research was uh, as they were my grandmothers and I knew a lot uh, them. I interviewed them. I take a lot of pictures of the house, the objects, the moving, the clothes, the, um, the neighborhood. Um, and I scan uh, the photo albums. And with all this material, after I create the, the story. But uh, first, I record all this material to have uh, to uh, para construir la historia. So with no? that, but the story, she record the voice and the memories, and, and then she worked with the pictures. So there was the line of the reality, and then the pictures. Mm -hmm. How did your grandmothers feel about the end in terms of its represent? Like seeing, did they see the, their own past in your work when it was fin finished? Uh, depend on my grandmother because one of them uh, was very has um, memory memory uh, was uh, uh, Parkinson and uh, when the uh, comic comes uh, she was worse uh, in my in the mind so she didn't understand very well but she she feel like oh I am here this is my home this is my cloth but like a child. But the other, yes, uh, she understands very good, and she, como se dice, se apropió de la historia. She appropriated the story. She was very proud. Yes, yeah. because uh, I don't. Uh, ella normalmente edulcora su vida, la hace más bonita. Pero aquí yo estaba hablando de algo un poco más men, más triste. So she had, she has a tendency to be very sweet with her past, but she was touching, and I was touching in a very painful moments and times of the Franco dictatorship and how they were repressed, so it was very interesting. Pero ella como que se ha apropiado ese discurso como político y es como, pues, está eso yo. So in some way she opened up and she appropriated and realized of the political discourse of what was happening. Mm. Well, let's, let's go to a really, um, to, from, from nice grandmother conversations to um, some pretty stark pictures um, that, you, that you had uh, there, Michael, in your collection. Um, how did the, um, the images, the visual images that you gathered, like influence the artwork that you created? And, and like, how did you find all of these images? Okay, the images, um, when I started researching this, I actually started this project in about 2009 or 08. And um, at the time, uh, when I, you know, you start looking for images from the famine, there would be about a standard 12 or 15 same images would come up. And then um, after 2014 and then after 2022, when Ukraine became the flavor of the month, um, there was suddenly a, a wealth of imagery that uh, came up. It's like everybody suddenly dug into their Ukraine files and said, oh, wait, there's there's more stuff here. Mm -hmm. Which is unfortunate because I was already like 90% through the book, right? So. That's how it always is. Yeah. <laughs> and because it was, in, in a lot of ways, I found it really frustrating that I was keep, I kept getting the same images, right? I'm like, come on, there's gotta be something else here. And there was, it was always the same, seven dead people in Kharkiv or somewhere, right? Yeah. And, and it, was, it was very frustrating in, in that way. So in a lot of ways, I had <laughs> to kind of take my imagined Ukrainian, like the idyllic Ukrainian village that my family always had in their minds, right? With the cherry trees and, and beautiful, uh, well-kept huts. And, uh, and then look at these stark black and white photos that were there and then try to, try to uh, just make it 
stark and I don't know, like mm. and and gray. That was that other one of the things. Actually, this is a comment about. Like, I'm going to talk about the art because my art style prior to this book was really, uh, I, I used a lot of brushwork. And this one I finished in gray tones using a ballpoint pen. So everything kind of has this murky look. And um, my wife actually said, you know, it's actually good that it's not, like it just has this sort of gray uh, miasma kind of look to it, right? And uh, so Yeah, that, it's definitely more loose than your other work. Yeah, and, and the other, uh, thing somebody else said it almost looks like it was done by somebody there and they snuck it out. Oh, it was, I like that. That's good. It was okay. Like uh, snuck out of the Soviet Union. Yeah. So. Well, um, I also wanted to do, talk to you about like how you, the, your most recent book, Kent State, you know, it's about the shooting and there's just so much material that you could have gone through. I remember you, I read somewhere that you, there was like, there's like 60, you said there's like 60 books about. Um, about the massacre, and then there's also like you listen to over a hundred interviews. I mean, a hundred did... oral histories. Uh, oh, more like 150. Yeah. Can you tell us about the process of like mapping out how how this book was going to look and like the types of images you were going to use? Like, how do you pick? And well, I mean, very early on, um, you know, I think everyone here probably goes through the same process. You have to decide what your book's about. And early on, I landed on, okay, I'm going to tell this entirely through the eyes of the four kids, the eyes and experience of the four kids who were killed. And so I wanted to put the reader, like, you know, right at their elbow, and we kind of walked through this story. And I thought that would make it very personal and very emotional. And, you know, when they're cut down, I mean, it really packs a wallop. Um, so my, that sort of funneled my research into getting close to anyone who knew them. So I talked to their roommates, I talked, I mean, it was more than just oral histories. I mean, they probably interviewed 60, 70 people. Mm -hmm. And those interviews could be very brief, but you know, they were, or some of them were very long, but I mean, I did talk to the people who, who knew them personally and who some of the people who were there uh, when they were shot and killed, they were right with them. So uh, that was my approach because you have to kind of push, I mean, you selectively edit, you know, things that didn't fit that, that concept of the book I had. I just said, well, I'll just, I'll put those aside. That's good stuff. But you don't want to cast too wide a net or your book becomes really unfocused. Yeah, and I feel like this is moving into the other conversation I wanted to have, which is about creating a coherent narrative out of real life, which I think is really hard to do. Like, it's, a, it's difficult to you know, um, uh, figure out which moments and things that you use because the way that life happens normally is, does not follow a, um, a, a traditional story structure for, for Western storytelling. Like when, when you were working out like the, lay, the, vision, the layout of, so I know that you, my understanding is, is you were looking at the, um, the maps of the university and mm. where things happened. And it feels like towards the, everyone should read this book, by the way, it's amazing, um, the Kent State, but there's like, it's like you're, you. you're leading everyone through this, you know, this space, um, mm -hmm. you know, like, and it seems like a very deliberate choice, like narratively, but also visually. Can you, can you speak to that a bit? Well, the narrative is, the other thing I did was that I took it down to those four days of unrest. I mean, it's not a story about you know, 10 years of unrest, and this is the bloody climax, which is what it really was. I just really boiled it down to those four days just to make it something I could wrap my head around and tell narratively, and I think it is a pretty strong narrative. I mean, it's like, you know, this led to this, led to this, led to this, and then boom. Um, so that's, again, a storytelling decision, and everyone has to make those, um, and that just comes from experience, I guess. Uh, what was the other part of the question, I'm sorry? Well, I think that we like creating a narrative out of real life is really tricky, and I think that you know there's different reasons for fictionalizing, like protecting people or like trying to like cover I like a great Fictionalize scope. nothing. Yeah, and that's what I mean. But you're making a choice to fictionalize. I actually thought about you recently because um, I was talking about comics journalism with someone, which is my area. Mm. And um, when I was at journalism school, I remember being told by a uh, you know older <coughs> like you know former former journalist like if you can't make a story out of the materials that exist, then you're just a crap journalist. Well, yeah, that's it's true. Like, you know, if you I think they told me that in journalism school too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, this is a great story. I mean, there was no reason to fictionalize any of it. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a phenomenal, one of the iconic events in American history, certainly modern American history. So, I mean, if you pick a strong story. Mm. I mean, that's that's... 
that's probably rule number one. Well, I want to. We haven't got much time left, but I'd really like to ask about um, uh, things that you cut, people cutting down things, or being respectful of personal stories. I know that Tracy, you've obviously like made choices to like <coughs> amalgamate stories. Um, Anna, did did you do you feel like um, you know uh, there was a level of communication between you and your grandmothers around respectful telling of their stories? Like, how did how did that work? Were you were you consulting with them? Um, uh, when I started the, the comic, because it was um, something more uh, like more, more chaotic, because I was studying fine arts, I didn't want in the beginning to do a comic, a big comic. It was just an exercise of class that finally was converting to that. So when I made the interview, we, I I was not publishing anything before. I just was making like a, an exercise. Mm. So uh, the perspective, we, I don't think in that that issues because and my grandmother's neither because I was not an author at that moment, and so I it was something more natural, mm. and it, 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 I have the respectful about the sex things. <laughs> because uh, my grandma, uh, Maruja, was very Catholic. So I have things about her sexual life that I would like to put in the history, but I don't put it because it was uh, respectful for her, mm -hmm. because I, I think that she was not agree with that. Yeah. As I knew her, them, I just, uh, como me di, balance. balance what things can I put in one way or maybe the other is in a conversation that you can understand. Yeah, yeah. And when, you're, when you were trying to figure out what you wanted to include, like this, uh, the, uh, Anna's book has like a really beautiful sequences of domestic life and like, you know, experiences that your grandmother's had, like they're really, your rendering is fantastic, but it's also like, I feel like you're right there in the room with them at these different ages. So I'm sort of wondering like how you picked those moments. Was there, were you trying to, was it, was, did you write up like a list? I want to hit this note or this note or like? I listen to the stories when I record uh, just in my computer and I write the moments I think they were more uh, mass potent, strong, strong. more strong and more symbolic about the, 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 mo <coughs> the historical moment. And also was very important the objects because where, as I made a lot of pictures of the home, there were a lot of objects in the house of them that were very symbolic and representative of their model of woman. Mm. So it was the objects uh, mixed with the histories I heard and also uh, with the things I live with them because I have very uh, close relationship with them. So it was like uh, to see these moments that were very like the first time uh, my grandma makes the, the dish of the lentejas, lentejas that soup. seems something uh, very casual and not important, but for her was very important and I want to, to understand why. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, th this is also a history thing, right? It's like you know, the ma learning how to make or cook something, you know, can, has different significances socially depending on when it is, right? Yeah, um, I want to. I've got to rush through here now. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Um, I also wanted to quickly, um, Tracy. Want to? I was really thinking a lot about you with this idea around um, the responsibility of telling real stories, like what they, you know, you've got. You, you want to communicate something that's very uh, an important political issue of the day through these people's stories, and um, there was a sequence that you wanted me to show. Um, can I? Do you want me to flick through to those? Yeah. That, that, the. So this was the first one. Right. So this is um, this is a story about a young woman from Guatemala, and I wanted you to see this because I, I. So one of the processes it wasn't just back to your question of visual and how do you do visual what was the visual part of the research. So just with, as with the manuscript, when I was talking to lawyers and I was talking to people in Guatemala and El Salvador, Honduras, and, and in Guinea, after I did that and I drew them, then I sent them back to people from those countries and asked them, well, first, I, you know, I just, I don't want to ask too many questions, actually, because you can, as, as I think Anna was saying or some, someone was saying, you don't want to lead people on. But you, you know, I wanted to make sure, do you see yourself in these and what are, what are, you know, look at this. And so 
this this uh, this was something I drew, and so I, like like some of the people on this panel, I was I was looking at photos, I was doing all this research, and I'm drawing something. But I because I'm from America and I'm from New York, I don't really know, and I, I really relied on these collaborations. And so this was a drawing of this young woman in Guatemala. And then if you go to the next slide, I hope you have it. Yes. Okay. So um, can you hear me if I stand up? So this drawing on the left was the drawing I sent. And the feedback I got, and part of, the, part of the thing if you're a journalist or a documenter, as I am, is to really listen to people and know that you may have to change things. And I had seven people looking at every page, from, from legal experts to people from the countries to fact checkers. In this case, with the visual, I sent that. And um, it was brought to, to women in a, in a village in the north of Guatemala that was similar to the place that this young woman was from. And the feedback I got was, well, we don't sit that way. We would never have our knees up. And we would be wearing skirts. And so I, I needed to change it. And, and then in the field, the brim of the hat wasn't wide enough. And we would be wearing long sleeves. And it was something, it's like this implicit bias where I thought I was doing the right thing. But you really need to work with people when you're telling someone else's story. And then also listen to them and be willing to change it. And there were, this happened with every, you know, with pages. And you, you don't know, like, what is someone wearing when they go to sleep? And, you know, when you're, when um, Michael and I were talking just outside, like, when you say, if you're writing prose and you say someone goes to sleep, they go to sleep. But it, when you're doing a graphic novel, you have to draw that. And what does that look like? And how, are you, how can you be sure that you're accurate? And so it was very important is, is, with a book like Unaccompanied to have collaborations and partnerships with people who have the lived experiences and then listen to them and make the changes. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for your time, everyone. Um, do we have time for questions from the audience? We've got 10 minutes. This is perfect. Does anyone have a question? If you have a question, can you go and speak in the microphones on either side? I've been trying to fill in the gaps between uh, what I know and what I don't know, and uh, historical research as well. I'm trying to write from the perspective of a little girl uh, who was my grandmother, who grew up in, during the coal mine wars of West Virginia. And I'm wondering if that is going to um, conflict with the history itself, which is pretty well written about. But uh, I'm a little concerned about trying to depict this almost forgotten history from the perspective of a little girl and how accurate that can be. Because a lot of it is uh, um, in conjecture on my part. Thank you. Well, my advice would be to, uh, whatever anecdote she has, try to find other sources that, that uh, validate that, you know, that anecdote. And the general rule in journalism school is three sources for everything. I mean, you can't always do it, but that's what you should be shooting for. So that material can come from anywhere, you know, news accounts government reports, uh, histories, whatever. But if you can find those links, then that, you know, then I would feel pretty confident in going ahead with that anecdote. Another question? Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Anna wants to speak because she's... Yes, of course, please. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, for me, it uh, is my point of view. I maybe could be the two ways, no? The maybe it's not the same. It's a contradiction. What is the the, the experience of the your grandma or your uh, the grandma, sí, no? Grandma. And the real information. But for me, it's not a problem to put together. It's just put maybe something in the TV or something that happened in a newspaper, something by the media that is the true, no, the, what is in the newspaper, and also what is the memory of the grandma. No? Um, for me, if you put this, this part as a documentary, it could, uh, como se dice, conviv convivir. Yes, the con you can balance in yeah. some ways how you're representing your grandmother and you imagine their childhood 
and the times were, were happening in her childhood. Yeah. And the acknowledgement. Yes, please, next question. Um, so I'm an archivist, and we try to make our collections as public as possible, but they can be very hidden. And it seems like in the research, I'm wondering if any of you use archival collections and how <laughs> you approach that kind of uh, that kind of research. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, the Kent State book in particular has you know massive archives both at Yale University and at Kent State, which just did mountain of material. But yeah, I, I leaned on it heavily. Um, I mean, I, it was readily available, and, and it was, uh, they were thrilled that I was using it. So yeah. Thank you <laughs> for <laughs> archiving things. <laughs> Um, I think archives are rad too, just quietly. <laughs> this is a really big thing that I think people um, should do more of is when you're researching stories, like there are collections in oh, so yeah. many universities and no one, not no one, but like they're underused, like more people could be using them than they do, yeah, for work. Um, thank you so much everyone for coming. Oh, one more question, yeah. One last question, going once, going twice. Uh, I think one of the speakers said uh, that you went back, oh, it was interesting how you made certain changes based on what people said, but when you do nonfiction, do you show the work to the people you uh, are drawing? Do they see it before publication? So the characters, a lot of the characters were composite, but in the case of Fanta, I sent everything that I did because I was working indirectly or directly, I guess indirectly uh, with her through her lawyer. Um, she saw everything and approved it. In, in the other cases, I guess that's, it's historical, so there wouldn't be current people to? Uh, no, it, it wasn't. It was more I found people with relevant lived experiences. And like Durf was saying, I had at least three people looking at each image right. and saying okay or some sometimes it was like change the shape of the nose and I would have to go back and change the shape <laughs> of all the noses <laughs> which is you know which is why actually I work digitally <laughs> um, and I was like thank goodness I'm working digitally because if I had to change every single nose it was a lot of noses um, and so when when people said things like that as I said that the job is is you, you have to ask the questions um, but you also have to listen and then you have to make the changes but for the other authors as well, there was, uh, uh, were there questions of having to show? Uh, case by case. I mean, if majors, people who were major sources, I would generally show them what they're seeing, you know, um, or a specific thing. But not, not everyone, no. I mean, I talked to so many people for Kent State. that My friend Dahmer was a very s small group of people, and yeah, I, I showed them what I did. Yeah, I sent them all copies, of, early copies of the book for feedback. Would you, did you change anything? I did, any, yeah, yeah, I did, yeah. Minor things, Yeah. but yeah. I think this is a really important question when it comes to like um, telling stories about people is like, you know, when someone says this is not right or right. I don't agree with this, like sometimes it could be that actually someone else just remembers it differently. Right. But like I think sometimes it's also, it's not important to the story or how have you found that? Sorry, I'm asking a question now, sorry. <laughs> oh no, I think it's vital. There's a very famous scene which was recounted in the movie, My Friend Dahmer again, where Dahmer actually met the Vice President of the United States. And uh, I, I originally wrote the scene and had it, they had them, they were getting a picture together, you know, like you do when, when you visit the White House. And I showed it to my friend who was there, who gave me that story, and he said, well, it's not b important, but there were no pictures, we just kind of met him. I was like, okay, so I changed that panel. And I think that's important. So yeah. that comes directly from showing him the scene. Yeah. 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 Oh, one more question. Uh, yeah, if we if we have time for one more question. question. No one's uh, telling me to stop yet, so <laughs> I'd say go. Someone held up a sign a little uh, while ago. I know for some of these, um, you all had very personal connections to it, but uh, others, I'm I'm not clear on kind of what your connection was. How did you decide that these are the stories that you wanted to spend time telling and these were the stories that you were, um, could tell um, just in terms of like the, the conversation about what you leave, uh, keep in and what you take out to create a narrative, like no two people are gonna do that alike. Um, so yeah, how did you land on these stories? 
to tell? That is a huge question. Yeah. <laughs> in, in, my, um, in my case, it uh, was because uh, I found a, a lack of representation of this generation of women in comics and also in literature, uh, in, but more in comics uh, that I read at the moment. Uh, there were no representation of this of this woman that are the grandmas or the women or the mothers of all a generation because the history of my grandmas is very similar uh, of the history of the other women of their generation. So I wanted to put in Baylor their lives because uh, as they have been taking care of others always as a secondary uh, characters of the lives of the others, I want to put, uh, to make an homage, 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 and they are also, they have also an experience and they have also participate uh, in the society, no? So I wanted, it was like a, this is the feminist part, I think uh, they, they are not feminist, but my perspective to their lives, yes. Tracy. Um. So uh, in my case, I, I've always been writing nonfiction for young adults about things that aren't spoken, talked about, or um, I, I don't think depicted in, in real ways. Um, and when, like in 2016 and 2017, I kept seeing these images of immigrants and migrants and borders in this language that was very de dehumanizing. And I kept thinking about the 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 young people who were walking here and I didn't all I could see was like these moments of pain this kind of deficit narrative and I actually wanted to know who are they and and they must be so strong and I, I just wanted to know more and I kept asking questions and that eventually led me to um, a, one of the organizations that help uh, unaccompanied refugee minors called the Safe Passage Project and um, with them, I actually went down to a courthouse and saw a court case happening and this 12-year-old sitting at a table with no representation and a lawyer from the government on the other side. And I was just like, oh my god, I, I had no idea this was going on. And I just couldn't stop thinking about it. And I, I, I said to them, what can I do? I'm a cartoonist and like, I just need to do something. I ended up working with them to make a comic about the legal system for their clients that was in Spanish and left in courthouses, but then there were these stories and I just kept wanting to find out more. It felt like they needed to be told and that uh, it's, it's not that this book is like an ultimate thing, it's more of a point of inquiry and a way to like start thinking about all these different questions that tie into America and immigration and migration and seeking asylum today. All right, we got to wrap. <laughs> so, can we do one sentence? No. Michael, one. No. One. Michael and Dirk, two, one sentence. Why did you do, why, why, why? Why did I do Red Harvest? Yes, one sentence. One sentence, uh, because it's a story that is not well known and it was a huge uh, uh, national trauma in Ukraine in 1932 and 33 when four million people died. And, um, they, uh, I just had to do it. And my background is Ukrainian, so. Yeah. Durf, why Kent State? Well, I, you know, someone, uh, there was an article, that I did an interview in, uh, in France last year, and, and the, the guy wrote, uh, all his books are written about uh, events that happened 20 mile, a 20 mile circumference from his, the house he grew up in. And I said, really? <laughs> That's, is that true? I was like, God damn it, that is true. <laughs> so, I mean, great stories are all around you, you know? Just look outside your window. They're there. That is an excellent note to end on. <laughs> Thank you so much.